Hello everyone, welcome again. So today's lesson will be on industrial chemistry, the option topic. And this series will be on the sodium hydroxide um, section of the syllabus. Okay, so sodium hydroxide is a very important industrial chemical and we'll talk about how we produce it um, in industry. Okay? But today's lesson will focus on the principles of electrolysis. Okay? Simply because uh, the production of self, uh, sodium hydroxide requires knowledge of electrolysis and so we're going to review it now so that you're well prepared to look at the reactions that are occurring in the sodium hydroxide processes. Okay? So here we are, just have a nice chemical cell, electrolytic cell, using pencils as electrodes because they're full of graphite. Okay? Just a cool little application of electrolysis. So electrochemical cells. There are two types of electrochemical cells. The galvanic cell. So these galvanic cells or batteries contain chemicals that react to produce electrical current. So like a battery. It's got chemicals in it, and that battery goes and produces electricity for you to use. So for instance, this little device here has a battery in it. The chemicals are reacting, producing electricity, so I can manipulate my slideshow here. And then the, the opposite of that is the electrolytic cell. So instead of chemicals reacting to form electricity, what we're doing is we're using electricity to force chemical reactions to occur. So we apply an electrical current, and that causes chemicals to react. Okay? So often these are reactions that wouldn't happen naturally. Um, so electrolytic cells are used mainly for refining metals and things like that. So let's talk about galvanic cells quickly. So a galvanic cell converts chemical energy, so the instabilities of chemicals, into electrical energy, so the movement of electrons. Okay. It consists of two half cells. So on this picture we have a half cell of zinc and a half cell of copper, linked by a salt bridge, which is here which is KNO3, uh, potassium nitrate, or some kind of semi-permeable membrane. An external metal conductor connected to each terminal conducts current. So here's our external connection, and that conducts electricity through the circuit. So on the left-hand side, we have the anode. The anode of the cell is where oxidation occurs. So there's an old sort of saying, an ox and red cat. So at the anode, oxidation happens, anox. Reduction happens at the cathode, red cat. So metal atoms in the anode oxidize into ions and then dissolve. This process leaves electrons, which travel through the conductor. So the anode is the negative terminal. Okay? So the zinc here, what happens is the zinc metal releases electrons and becomes the zinc ion. Then it goes into solution, that zinc ion, that is. The electron travels around the cell, as we had before, and then at, goes to the other side. So over time, you'll notice the zinc metal decreasing in size, and you'll lose that all of that zinc. Now on the other hand, if we have the cathode, uh, or the other side of the, the half reaction, this is where reduction occurs. So red cat, remember? Reduction occurs at the cathode. So the positive metal ions in this solution, so the copper here in the, in the solution, will absorb the electrons from the other side to form atoms and precipitate on the cathode. So they'll form atoms in this solution and then stick to the, the copper electrode okay, as pure copper atoms. Now this process uses up electrons, so the cathode is positive. So once those, uh, once those electrons have been absorbed and you get those copper atoms, what happens is the copper electrode will tend to get bigger and it'll get bigger proportional to the other one getting smaller. Okay? So you'll see that the copper gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Now the current in the galvanic cell is that electrons flow from the negative terminal to the positive terminal. So they'll go this way. For the physics people, or the physics majors, um, you'll see that uh, we define the current in the opposite direction there because we're a bit silly like that. So ions pass through the salt bridge to keep the solutions neutral. So the question is, well, what does that mean? How, do, how does that work? So if you notice here, as the zinc decreases, there'll be lots and lots of zinc ions in the solution because the zinc metal is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So what you'll see is that there'll be lots and lots of positive charges in here. So 
the NO3 will drift that way because it's attracted to all those positive charges. And conversely, you'll get a decrease in Cu2 plus here, so there'll be an increase in SO4 2 minus. So there'll be lots of negative ions here. So the K or the potassium will drift slowly to this side to balance out those charges because of simply just electrostatic attraction. So this cell produces a direct current. Okay. So if you were to look at it, the, the, the negative charges, the electrons, are always going this way. And then you notice that the NO3, which is also negatively charged, is going around. So you see the negative charges are just doing this, going in this direction. And the positive charges are going in this direction. Okay? So that's how it works. And it produces direct current. So they don't, they don't change direction any time in that circuit. So here we have it. Now, this is an electrolytic cell now. So we have a battery here instead of just a voltmeter or some sort of measurement device. And so this electrolytic cell converts electrical energy into chemical energy. So it creates less stable chemicals by inputting electrical energy. So the reactions are not spontaneous. Um, so both electrodes can be placed in the same container. Okay, so you can see in the spontaneous reaction that produces energy, we had to separate the two solutions. Whereas now, because it's not spontaneous, it takes energy to do this. We can put them in the same solution, in the same container. No problem. Save space and things like that. So an external power source is connected to each electrode, which provides the current. And the anode of the cell is where oxidation occurs. So anode is always where oxidations occur. Okay. So, so in this case, the Cu, the Cu is the um, is the anode because it's releasing electrons and it's oxidizing. So the power source draws electrons away from the terminal, leaving ions that dissolve in the solution. So you can see the Cu, electrons are getting pulled out of it, and then it forms Cu2 plus and goes into solution. Okay? To lose electrons, the anode must be connected to the positive terminal because the electrons will be attracted to this side because it's positive. If it was negative, they would be repelled, and then you'd have an issue. The cathode is where reduction occurs. So it's where the electrons go. So you can see the electrons go to this side, and they combine with the Cu2 plus to give you the Cu metal, and then that forms on the other side. So positive metal ions in solution combine with electrons on the cathode and form a metal coating on the same terminal, on the terminal. Okay. The process requires electrons, so the cathode is connected to the negative terminal. Because it needs electrons, you would want to connect it to the negative terminal, because that will repel electrons. So the current of an electrolytic cell. So the electrons flow out of the negative terminal of the power supply and into the positive terminal of the power supply. So they go this way, you can see. Okay. Ions are pushed through the solution by the subsequent buildup of charge. So if we were to just leave it, there'd be lots of electrons on this side, and the copper ions that are positively charged will be dragged to this side because there's lots of electrons here, because okay? they're attracted to those negative charges. The cell uses, uh, can remove ions from solution. So one of the uses of the cell is that it can remove ions from a solution. So a car battery. So a car battery consists of six galvanic cells in series, and these are the lead, lead oxide cells. And to recharge the battery, we treat it like an electrolytic cell, or we run it in the opposite direction. So that's a really typical thing of science. We have an awesome phenomena in one direction, and then if we want to re reverse it, we just, just run it in the backward direction, and then all of a sudden it acts differently. So motors, and motors take in electrical energy to spin, and generators take in mechanical energy to create, produce electricity. So that's just one example. The recharging process uses electricity to restore the original composition of the cell. So as time goes on, the, de the chemicals in the cell deplete and change into other things. Then we pump it full of electrons, and it turns back the other way and goes back to its original form. Okay? That's how a car battery works. That's the job of your alternator in your car. So that wraps up today's review of electrolytic and galvanic cells. So hopefully you've 
remembered all these things that we learned in production of materials. And hopefully you'll now be ready to study sodium hydroxide production um, in the future lessons. So move on to the question segment. Briefly define electrolysis. Well, electrolysis is the process in which electrical current is used to bring about a chemical change which would not occur spontaneously. Okay? Very simple definition. Are the following statements true or false? The anode is negative in a galvanic cell but positive in an electrolytic cell. Okay? Think about that one. So it's true. The anode oxidizes in a galvanic cell, so it produces electrons. So that means it's the negative terminal, correct? But in an electrolytic cell, it also oxidizes, so electrons are also leaving that side, but they're being drawn away by the battery, and the battery would be the positive side. Okay, so it's in both cases, it's true, just the, the polarity of it is different. So in an electrolytic cell, electrons must be supplied to the anode, in a galvanic cell, electrons are produced by the oxidation process. Okay? In both galvanic and electrolytic cells, the cathode is the site of reduction. Okay? Yes, that's true. Cathode is always the site of reduction. It might help to use the mnemonic red cat. Reduction at cathode. Okay? That's what the one I use all the time. Electrical energy is used to cause a non-spontaneous chemical reaction in an electrolytic cell. And that's true. A galvanic cell produces electrical energy, but an electrolytic cell consumes that energy. An oxidation of the anode material is possible in both electrolytic and galvanic cells. That's true also. It might help to use the mnemonic anox, oxidation at anode. So no matter what happens, oxidation happens at the anode, reduction happens at the cathode for electrolytic, galvanic, or any other electrochemical cell that you can think of. Galvanic cells and electrolytic cells are always composed of two separate containers separated by a salt bridge. Now that's false. Electrolytic cells can often keep both terminals in the same container because they're non-spontaneous reactions. Okay. Question 3. A beaker of water undergoes electrolysis. The initial mass of the water is 100 grams and the final mass is 91 grams. What volumes and species of gas are produced? Well, if we electrolysize water, we can only get hydrogen and oxygen. So there's our reaction, okay? Now, total moles of water that have been electrolysized are simply the mass of water that's been electrolysized. So you can see there's 9 grams that's been taken away, 100 minus 91. And the molar mass of water is just 16, which is the molar mass of oxygen, plus 1.01, which is the molar mass of hydrogen. So there's our number, which is about 0.5 moles. Now, 0.5 moles of water, um, which is 12.4 liters, of hydrogen gas are also produced. So, if you look here, one, two, and two. So, if you produce, if you consume one mole of water, you produce one mole of hydrogen gas. And in this case, we're, produ we're consuming 0.5 moles, so we must also produce 0.5 moles of hydrogen gas. And this one is half of this one, so we only produce 0.25 moles of oxygen. Okay, And to get these numbers, we just simply multiply by the standard lab conditions or the standard temperature and pressure, which is 24.79 for the latter and 21.71 for the former, I think. So you can look that up on the back of your periodic table. Okay, So that's how we do that. Question 4. Write down the half equations for the reaction that occurs at the copper cathode of a galvanic cell if it is immersed in a copper sulfate solution. So that must be a galvanic cell because we're putting it in the same half equation in the same in one container separated from the other one. So you get Cu2 plus plus 2E minus gives you Cu. So you can see that more than likely the copper ion will absorb electrons and turn into the copper metal. So write down the half equation for the reaction that occurs at the nickel cathode of an electrolytic cell if it's immersed in a copper sulfate solution. So we're going to see that the, in this case the copper is doing the same thing. The copper is absorbing electrons and turning into the copper solid. Okay. 
Write down the half equation for the reaction that occurs at a zinc anode if it is immersed in a zinc sulfate solution. So it oxidizes and forms the zinc ion because it's very reactive. And then in the same case, write down the half equation for the reaction that occurs at the copper anode of an electrolytic cell if it is immersed in a potassium nitrate solution. So it's an electrolytic cell, so we must be pumping energy in. So that must mean that the copper is turning into copper ions, which doesn't usually happen, but because we're putting so much energy in, it's happening now. Okay? So that wraps up today's lesson on electrolytic cells. Hopefully you've reviewed all of the things that you need to about electrolytic cells, and so you'll be ready to study sodium hydroxide in its entirety. So I look forward to seeing you at our next lesson. Mm -hmm.